Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. A proud tradition is a must for a fighting army. Past deeds of glory serve as an example, an inspiration for the soldiers of today. An army post which almost breathes tradition is Fort Monroe in Virginia, headquarters of the Continental Army Command, and incidentally, an attraction for tourists from all over the country. To give viewers of the big picture our own quick tour of historic Fort Monroe, not long ago, we flew down to the extreme tip of Virginia's lower peninsula. From the air, it's easy to see that Fort Monroe is really a fort within a fort. Begun in 1819, it is the largest enclosed fortification in the United States, covering 63 acres of ground. Around the fort is a moat, 60 to 150 feet in width. Pathetic as it may be in the face of modern weapons of war, in its day, when a stone wall was still the answer to gunfire, Fort Monroe was a brilliant concept in seacoast defense. Yes, the surroundings may have an aura of bygone days, but that's all there is about the past at Connacht. The words of Commanding General Willard G. Wyman highlight the present and future of the Continental Army Command. I'm very happy to introduce you to the headquarters of Continental Army Command, located here at Fort Monroe on Old Point Comfort, Virginia. It is significant in this respect that we are located in the shores of Hampton Roads, where during the Civil War, the first ironclad vessels of war challenged each other for the first time in battle. New weapons in a wartime laboratory. Now in peacetime, we endeavor to look still further ahead. Fortunate, too, are we, located within a few air minutes of the Tactical Air Command at Langley Field. Blood brothers of ours on the battlefield. That powerful air force that opens the way for the Army victory. No less important is the Navy, which keeps the Army alive on distant shores. Just across the bay at Norfolk is the Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Fleet with his headquarters. Three services of the utmost mutual importance to each other. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force. Your team for national defense. My appointment with a public information officer was for later that day. And there was time first for some sightseeing around historic Fort Monroe. Known first as Fort Algernon, the original fortifications were started by the English in 1609, a good many years before our country was founded. And that's the first thing to strike you about Fort Monroe, how long it has served so well. From 1609, this defense point, later named Fort George and still later Fort Monroe after the nation's fifth president, has quartered fighting men from near and far. The fortifications were destroyed once by fire, twice by storms. At one time, the fort was rebuilt by men commanded by a young lieutenant, later to become famous as General Robert E. Lee. There is a sense of history in every corner of Fort Monroe. And to help visitors understand its role in some very stirring events, a small museum has been set up within one of the old walls of the fort, the Casemate Museum. Here, a sergeant from the Public Information Office answered my question. What are the main sightseeing attractions at Fort Monroe? Well, Sergeant Queen, that would be difficult to answer because so many things have happened here at Fort Monroe, historically speaking, that uh, I just couldn't quite concentrate on one point. Uh-huh. I noticed that a great many tourists visit this post. They do from all over the world coming in. Uh, when did uh, this tourist popularity here at Fort Monroe begin? Sergeant Queen, I don't think I would care to answer that question because 
There are so many things about Fort Monroe that have to do with America's past. You know, this area has been a, a resort area since way back in 1832. Why 1832, Sergeant Simpson? That was the end of the Black Hawk War, you remember, and at that time, Chief Black Hawk and several of his chiefs were brought here to Fort Monroe and held prisoner. And people came from far and wide to see these, uh, well, they were downright celebrities here. And uh, then they told their friends about how interesting Fort Monroe was. And thus, it was built up as a resort area. Listening to Sergeant Simpson, I realized why this post is most fascinating to those interested in our Civil War period. Fort Monroe was a Union stronghold throughout the Civil War, even though it was deep in Confederate territory. It served as a staging area for thousands of Union troops. In other words, the Union troops were right here within almost the Confederate lines. That's right. And just across the Bay of Norfolk was the Confederate troops. I think, Sergeant Queen, that if you were coming to our museum, you would learn a lot more about Fort Monroe than I could tell you. Thank you very much, Sergeant Simpson. I think I will just look around. The Casemate Museum consists of a series of small rooms hewn out of the fortress wall. Of particular interest is a room commemorating the sea battle between the first ironclad ships, the Union's monitor, the famous cheese box on a raft, against the Confederacy's Merrimack. The battle took place on March 9, 1862, at Hampton Roads, just off the walls of Fort Monroe. And on the walls of the room was a drawing of the famous battle, which turned back the Confederacy's bid for naval supremacy. Next along the wall were other drawings of highlights and personalities in the Fort Monroe past. Robert E. Lee as a lieutenant of engineers. A recital of his poetry by Edgar Allan Poe in 1849. Poe was a former sergeant major at the post. And the memorable day in 1862 when a famous president stepped ashore to visit a strong point of his nation's defenses. These and other mementos of a storied past line the walls of the Casemate Museum. The adjacent room is simply furnished. A bed, a table, a chair, a Bible. The cell where Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, was brought after the defeat of the South in the Civil War. A chair next to the cot of Jefferson Davis, a tribute to the memory of Dr. Craven, chief medical officer at Fort Monroe, who befriended the captured Confederate president and helped him win better conditions. Close by the Casemate Museum is another hallowed building linking Fort Monroe's past with their present the lovely Chapel of the Centurion. Serving as a post chapel for Fort Monroe, it is open daily for prayer. With me on my visit was Chaplain Mills, post Protestant chaplain. Chaplain Mills, I understand that the chapel was erected almost 100 years ago. Uh, yes, Sergeant Queen. It was built in 1858 by Lieutenant Julian McAllister, a young officer at Fort Monroe, as a thanks offering. A thanks offering? Yes, Lieutenant McAllister and two other officers were working in a Fort Monroe laboratory. There was a bad explosion. Uh, McAllister escaped unharmed, but his two companions were killed. In recognition of the divine providence which had spared his life, uh, Lieutenant McAllister sponsored the building of this chapel with his own funds and money collected from friends. I kept thinking of the story of Lieutenant McAllister as we walked on. And a moment later, we were inside the cool quiet of the chapel of the Centurion. The chapel is dedicated to St. Cornelius, patron saint of military men, who was converted to the Christian faith by the Apostle Peter. Cornelius was a Roman Centurion, an officer commanding 100 men. And that's why the name Chapel of the Centurion. Hanging from the walls of the chancel and nave 
are the flags and colors of old regiments of the United States Army. These flags, faded and worn over the years, have rustled quietly over many a national leader who has come here for moments of spiritual repose. Among them was President Woodrow Wilson, who more than once left Washington to spend weekends at Fort Monroe, where he worshiped in this flag-lined chapel. The stained glass windows are dedicated to the military men who have served at Fort Monroe, all good and faithful servants whose memory will always be cherished by a grateful nation. They served in the watchful, quiet years of peace and in the rumble and thunder and sacrifice of war. Some fought in the early battles that long ago entered the chronicles of American history, and some died for their country in recent years. Still fresh in memory, died in Korea so kids next door may live. The spirit of the Chapel of the Centurion is best expressed by these windows and the gallant men whose memory they revere. So the kids next door may live. Fittingly enough, just opposite the Chapel of the Centurion is the Chapel Center, which provides religious training for all age groups, with emphasis on the young. There are three youth chapels here. In an atmosphere that is pleasant and spiritually uplifting, they worship regularly. The post has always been a leader in the field of soldier and dependent education. Watching a Bible class at the center conducted by one of the many volunteer workers, you get an idea how moral training is emphasized here in a wholesome, interesting manner. No wonder, then, religious classes are among the most popular activities at Old Fort Monroe. And for that matter, there's many a reason why it is a popular post with the men stationed here. The blend of the old as an ancient cannon set against the new of a luxurious off-post hotel where many visitors stay. All this gives Monroe a certain something, a unique, only place like it quality that men appreciate long after they've left. Whether he wanders up to the old lighthouse and looks across the water to where the monitor fought the Merrimack, or whether he enjoys an hour of relaxation at the officer's club, set in the coolness of an old casemate a room cut into the actual wall of the fort. Or whether he spends a lot of his free time at the enlisted man's club. Any soldier stationed at Monroe will tell you life at Monroe can be mighty pleasant. And the outdoor swimming pools don't hurt one bit. Dependent housing is available, with plenty of room for kids to play and a wonderful view of the Atlantic to boot. There's even an unofficial dog cemetery where Rover and Fido and company are laid to rest. Impressions mingle, one with another, as you walk through Fort Monroe. There are the old quarters built in 1819, still in use. The churches, so that men and women of every faith can worship in their own way. There is the impressive grandeur of General's Row, from where by 7.30 every morning, senior officers have left for work. On sunny Sunday afternoons, the thumping beat of a brass band sounds out from Chamberlain Park as the soldiers offer a concert. one end of Monroe to the other, the stirring music can be heard. It washes over the empty gun emplacements and blares across the water where sailors on freighters, bound for Europe and South America, come up on deck to listen. 
How many times do you suppose these ancient moat walls have echoed to the music of the Fort Monroe Band? Almost a countless number. For these stone barriers were built to ward off the musket and the cannonball, and still stand today in the era of the rocket and the guided missile. Surely the fort is no bulwark of defense today. It is more a symbol of the unwavering, unfaltering past of a great nation. But the everyday work at Monroe, the work of Connor, concerns itself with the past only as a lesson for the present and a guide to the future. And the future of our army, that is the business of Connor, as I soon learned in my interview with one of Fort Monroe's public information officers. How do you do, sir? How are you? Sit down, please. Major Gordon Andrews is one of the public information officers of the Continental Army Command. Major, would you outline for our big picture audience some of the important functions of CONART? Well, as you know, the soldier forces within the United States are divided into the six armies and the military district of Washington. The six armies covering a section of the country. The commanding general commands the six armies and the military district of Washington. Along with this command function, he is also responsible to the chief of staff for many of the other functions. Would you mind spelling out the more important ones for us, sir? It is the job of the Continental Army Command to create improved weapons and develop doctrine, tactics, and techniques for a modern defense force. Connock officers must look into the future, planning for new weapons and uniforms of war together with the know-how to use them to the greatest advantage. Working with its six field testing agencies, known as boards, as well as an Arctic test branch, Conarch's development and test section keeps tabs on how theory works out in practice. At Board 1, for example, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, Conarch men have participated in many tests to improve the Honest John a rocket capable of delivering various types of warheads at long range. Fort Knox, Kentucky is the headquarters of Conarch's Board 2. Here, the dust and grime of operational use test the latest in armored vehicles and automotive equipment as the M-59 armored infantry carrier, or the T-101 self-propelled gun. Every piece of rolling equipment gets a rough going over as Conarch men watch and report on the need for possible changes. The T-101 shows a lot of balance as it goes through one obstacle after another to prove it's good enough to join the Army's armada of mobile weapons. At Fort Benning is Conarch's Board 3. Its primary function is to review the performance of infantry weapons, like the 106 millimeter recoilless rifle, which displays its effectiveness for Conarch men who stand by on the range during firing tests. Fort Bliss, Texas, headquarters of Conarch's Board 4 which is primarily concerned with the Nike guided missile, now being used in many defense locations throughout the United States. Board four men constantly analyze the procedure for moving the missile into firing position, trying to streamline and speed up the operation without in any way sacrificing the safety factor for operating personnel. Board 4's field of interest also extends to target drone planes, pilotless machines hurtling through the air under complete control of men on the ground. Anti-aircraft weapons represent another important area of Board 4 activity. They are put through rigorous firing tests regularly.
At Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Conarch's Board 5 tests communication and electronic equipment in cooperation with the Signal Corps. Conarch officers travel to all parts of the country to examine new developments like combat television, as when put through test at a recent combat demonstration in Fort Meade, Maryland. The advancing troops may be way up ahead, but the television screen tells those at headquarters how things are going. Field radar installations and other electronic equipment are run through constant operational tests under the supervision of Conarc Board 5. Fort Rooker, Alabama, a name and a place synonymous with Army aviation. Here, Conarch's Board 6 tests Army aircraft and air support equipment, which covers a lot of territory and a lot of different types of late model light aircraft used by the Army. Fort Greeley, Alaska, home of Conarch's Arctic Test Branch. In ice and snow, battling sub-zero weather, Conarch men watch and report as men and equipment go through performance tests. Guns blast across the frozen Arctic, just part of Conarch's extensive program for observing how material meets the test of combat conditions through its six boards and the Arctic test branch. The scene, any one of many Army installations throughout the world. A projector is turned on for a training film. Conarch is concerned here too, for another of its functions is to prepare Army instructional material training aids that result in quick learning of Army skills. Conarch also supervises the training of individuals and units of the reserve forces. Conarch prepares plans for the ground defense of the continental United States. And also maintains liaison with appropriate Canadian and Mexican defense agencies. And lastly, but of vital interest to areas hit by disasters, as the floods that have raged over wide stretches of the country in recent years, Conarch prepares plans for and is ready to assist civil authorities in securing immediate relief when a disaster suddenly strikes a widespread area. That's a very abbreviated, very much simplified run through of some of the important functions of the Continental Army Command. Thank you, Major. By the way, where's that band music coming from? That's from our parade ground. You're just about to get in on the awarding of the Soldier of the Month here at Fort Monroe. A few minutes later, a parade was taking place on the Carpet Green Parade ground. I stood on the sidelines watching the ceremonies. Fort Monroe's Soldier of the Month received his award. Then the troops passed in review. Certainly, it was not massive as army parades go. We've all seen parades with louder brass bands, with more marching men and women. But it was impressive just the same. On this parade ground, surrounded by the mementos of the army's proud past, one got a real sense of the continuity of the United States fighting forces. Yes, here.
here in the atmosphere of the old, where Continental Army Command is planning the Army's new look, you realize this. Since the long ago days of our country's founding, there has always been a proud fighting army ready to defend America. Historic Fort Monroe, home of the Continental Army Command, still plays a prominent and vital role in the national security of the United States. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.